Uh, so we are in Guoyi Ho. We got Lizzie and Cheryl. I'm Aaron. And Lizzie and Cheryl, tell, tell me about uh, how you guys got here, um, you know, looking for your house, the, the type of work you're doing now. Tell me all that. Well, when we came back for our second term, we were filling in for some fellow missionaries in Taichung and we're there for about nine, nine months to a year. And so towards the end of that time, we started looking at ministry opportunities elsewhere in Taiwan. At the time we knew we wanted to go rural and we knew we wanted to work with um, at-risk kids and families or marginalized families. And so we started kind of seeing uh, who knew who, or if there were any connections and what current OMF teams were doing that kind of ministry. So we visited a team in Meishan, we also visited a new church plant down in Pingdong. And while we were having dinner with a missionary friend from another organization, she said, hey, I know someone who knows someone who is a teacher down in Tainan, rural Tainan. And she's looking for missionaries or pastors to come along and help her parachurch ministry and either plant a church or connect people to a church. So we said, well, hey, if you want to connect us, go for it. So from there, from her, we were connected to this missionary friend of hers who happened to be back in America at the time. And she, within the next 12 hours, connected us with her local friend who's the teacher. Her name is Susie. And Susie, within the next probably six hours, invited us to come down over last Chinese New Year, full year ago now, to come visit her and see the ministry. And as soon as we came and we saw what she was doing, the after-school program for the kids, uh, building connections through this program with, uh, hello, <laughs> with um, the parents and just meeting uh, the physical needs of these families as well as uh, educational needs and spiritual needs, we're like, this is it. This is where we want to be. So, uh, yeah, so that was how we got connected with this, this area. Previous to that, we had no idea she was here, but God just put the right people in the right place at the right time, and it led us here. And so we've been here since June, because uh, it took quite a while to find a house, actually, in rural Taiwan is not an easy process. All right, how you? about the house. <laughs> All right, so trying to find a place in rural Taiwan is difficult. Uh, generally, people don't rent, they're trying to sell. We looked at multiple homes. One had extensive water damage. One, uh, an elderly lady had committed suicide. One, a gentleman. A garage of somebody. <laughs> Just the garage. Just the garage. Just the, for 3,000 NT. Yeah. Yeah. In yeah. uh, the, the garage did have a bathroom. Mm. Uh, and then there was a home where a gentleman had been found dead uh, by his eldest daughter. And that, at one point, was our best option. Yeah. So with with Taiwanese people, actually, they, they probably find it hard to look for tenants for places where people have died because perhaps possibly ghosts and other bad luck. There's a lot of fear, a lot of fear. Yeah. yeah. And so the idea was honestly to move into either the home where the elderly lady had committed suicide or uh, where the gentleman had died. And just to be a witness to the neighbors, to the community, that as Christians, we don't live in fear of ghosts or dead relatives or any spirits because our God is bigger than any of that. Mm. And we're really looking forward to that. Uh, unfortunately, one of the places, uh, and there's a lot of birds up there, uh, one of the places uh, needed extensive renovations. Uh, the wiring in the home was actually almost as old as Cheryl, uh, and it needed to be replaced badly. And the other home, though it was a limited space, the lady that currently owned it still wanted to keep about a third of the space to herself, which would greatly hinder what we could do there, what we could you know, bring down with us, how we could maximize the space for ministry. It, I mean, it, it's like taking a leg away from a runner. It really <laughs> made things difficult. And so we kept looking and looking 
and then COVID started to ramp up a little bit here. And it's really difficult to like go to a community and say, hey, you don't know me. I'm an obvious foreigner. Uh, you don't know when I got off a plane. Can I rent your place? Right. So we were very dependent upon our local friends and partners at that time. So they would look for stuff during the week and then we would come down on the weekend. And uh, during that time of searching for a house, we actually found that there was a church in the neighboring village. And so we started to attend there on Sundays just to check them out and see how they were and um, get to know them a little bit. And uh, they're a great, great biblical, biblically founded church in tiny rural Taiwan, which is quite a surprise. Um, and so we were very excited about the possibility of partnering not only with our friend Susie and her after school ministry, but with this church and what they were doing in this community as well. So one of those days we were house hunting, I came down in tears, not uncommon for me, and <laughs> went in and asked the associate pastor if he had a moment to talk. So he stepped aside from the after school class that he was leading to console this very upset missionary. And I just poured out how difficult it was finding a house and if he could help or if he knew anybody in the community had any connections. He was very kind, very sweet to this complete stranger of a foreigner just bawling in front of him. And from there, he connected uh, with the village elder in our now village. And that person knew of somebody who was uh, essentially re-renting. Re they had previously rented this house out and now we're looking for a new renter. And we happened to come along right at that time. So through the connection of our local partner with other local leaders, we found our house. And so that was probably altogether what, like a three to four month it process? Was three and a half, almost four months. It was a long searching. time of searching, yeah. Multiple trips, an hour, two and a half hours Both. to come down. Mm. You know, it can, be, it can be disheartening at times. Mm. You know, you really want to move. You see a ministry and you're like, I want to be there. I want to be a part of this. Mm. And you can't. So... You, you, I mean, you, you're fairly new to this place. What, what is it like starting from the ground up? How do you, how do you meet people? Um, how do you, you know, get connect with the community? What sort of things uh, have you guys tried and hope to try? Well, at 7 or 30, everybody goes to bed. So evening ministry is not <laughs> likely. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> um. Uh, in our case, we came because God had already started doing a work through some of uh, the local Christians who had moved here. Uh, so in the case of our friend Susie, she came here about six years ago because she really felt like God was telling her to come and meet the educational and social and spiritual needs of these young kids who don't have opportunities like city schools might. So because she's been here kind of starting that ministry, starting that um, tilling of the soil, so to speak, she's already made connections with these families. And she's a teacher, so she's, she's got a, a place of respect within the community. So when we came down here, we first started kind of using her connections with people as a way to get to know these families and these households. And we did the same with our pastor friends who have, have made some connections here this uh, church that we're serving with is a new church plan. It's been around for about two years. And so uh, we started to also work with them in their after school program to meet their parents and the kids. So together we do things like barbecues or like bicycle outings, things like that, to be able to meet and connect with parents. Uh, after we teach at one of the after school programs, uh, Lizzie and I go to a night market in our little village <laughs> and so we'll see the parents and some other people in this night market. We also like to go back to the same businesses over and over. So um, there's only like what three or four breakfast shops in our village three. but we always make it a point to return to the same two and try to build these relationships with the people who are working there. And then, of course, as you come and go, you run into neighbors and have conversations with them as well. Um, do you want to share some other ways maybe we connect with people? I'm trying to say. 
Well, Lizzie does a farming ministry. Yes, okay. So he's helping a farmer, meeting the farmer's actual physical needs. Uh, he, he's on his own pretty much. He's able to hire um, seasonal workers from time to time, but it's a very lonely job. <laughs> and he has uh, a decent plot of land that needs attention. So with COVID at the time, when uh, there were more restrictions, even the um, seasonal workers didn't want to come and work because they were afraid they might get sick. So he was left all on his own. And, and he, at that particular season as well, had lots of flooding in his field. Yeah. So Lizzie, hearing this need, um, was able to offer assistance. After, and so it's... After praying, I, I prayed about it first because there's always a need. Mm -hmm. There will never be a lack of needs. And so we need to be wise about how we're spending our time, where we're investing our time. And so I did pray about it. And I'm not an outdoorsy work kind of person, <laughs> but I felt God tell me to move ahead with it. And so I have. Um, I have weeded things. I have used a motorized plow to cut ditches. I have laid plastic over fields. I've run irrigation lines. I've planted uh, different vegetables. These are things I have absolutely no experience in. And God has allowed our break times um, to have conversations about creation, about social justice, about uh, different religious things like reincarnation. We've also joked around about how if uh, he asked his wife for 10 more kids, she would say she had no need for him. Mm. Uh, we, we, we joke and have fun in the midst of doing all this work, which is his livelihood. Mm. You know, it's, he is a farmer, and if the farm doesn't do well, he cannot provide for his family. He has two children, he has a wife, and if that goes belly up, what happens? So, I mean, country, country Taiwan is, is not as rural as some other countries, but it's still, it's still very different to city life in Taiwan. Yes. So, um, tell me about some of the, I guess, experiences you've had, which were kind of very unique to your, your country living here. Sure. When we moved in, it was uh, spring moving into summer. And uh, we found out that in our community here during that time of the year, all the frogs are born. And so we're moving in and it's raining. And then as a couple days go by, I look outside and I literally thought the ground was moving. And I was like, what is going on out here? So I look and sure enough, I mean, just little baby frogs the size of like the tip of your pinky, just hopping around everywhere. And like try as you might to avoid them, you know that like under your feet or your scooter or your car, something is getting squished. And so <laughs> that is not an experience I can say that I've had in the city here in Taiwan. Um, so definitely nature literally is at your front door. We have geese that wake us up every morning. They like to honk and quack pretty loudly. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's <laughs> quite amusing. We have lots of stray cats and dogs in our particular village, so. Um, me being a cat person, I like to go out and take care of them. So it brings up conversation opportunities with my neighbors who are like, doesn't the cat bite you? Won't it hurt you? I'm like, no, 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 it's okay. You just got to be smart. Uh, so that's another thing. Speaking of neighbors, we have a neighbor lady, an ama, a grandma, who, uh, who will literally just find some sort of fruit or vegetable at her house and walk right on into our house to say hello, and then just start looking around. And that is not something I've experienced in the city. So should walk in without knocking? No knocking, no introduction, no, hey, are you home? She'll literally come to the door, try opening it, and then just come right on in. She did that one time when you were having a <laughs> virtual language right. class. Right, so I'm in class, and all of a sudden the Emma's like in my living room with fruit, and I'm like, oh, sorry, teacher, here, hold on just one moment. My grandma came over, I have to go talk to her. And so it's quite funny. Hey, puppy. <laughs> Hope your owner comes back. But uh, yeah, so that's quite amusing. And then the other neighbor, the other Emma on the other side, she was hilarious. 
And when we first moved in, because people are like, who are these weird people moving into this tiny little village? Like, why are they coming here? There's no reason why, you know, foreigners come to such a rural place unless they're going to work on the farms or the factories. And so she would come and she would just start walking by our house and kind of turn her head to like peek in, but try to do it nonchalant. Like, I'm not really looking, but I'm looking, but I'm not looking. And then she'd walk back and go the other way. And then a couple minutes later, we'd see her doing the same thing again and go back. And in the city, that just wouldn't happen to us. But here, everyone's like, who's the new person who's moved in? And then we go to get breakfast three days later and we order our food and the uh, uh, shop owner, yes, shop owner, of the restaurant was like, hey, yeah, yeah, I know you guys. You just moved in four days ago down over here on this street. And we're like, wow, <laughs> news travels fast. <laughs> So. I, I joked earlier about not doing anything after 7.30. In rural Taiwan, uh, yeah. people are farmers or they work in the factories. <laughs> and they go to bed early and they wake up early. Uh, the trash truck in our neighborhood goes by at 7.30. And after 7.30, all of our neighbors close their gates, turn off their lights, and they go to bed. And this morning, as you saw... Uh, when we were leaving the house, the neighbor, the ama, she was getting ready for her morning bike ride. You know, it's that was six in the morning, yeah. and so yeah, I, there's not a nightlife here. So I'm gonna wait till we're past the scooter. It's a little loud. Isn't the, that's the main temple in town. Right? That's one of one the of two. Them. Yeah. So uh, just so you know, I'm gonna go up here, turn. I'm actually going to take the back way by the other temple. So. Yeah, yeah, the road we're walking down is like the old main street. So it's kind of a, it's got a neat, neat little character to it. You can see a lot of history on the street. But uh, now that the freeway has come through, there's sort of a, a highway that goes to the side of the town, which is pretty common for rural areas as well. They get bypassed, right? And so uh, this is a, fun little street to walk down and be reminded of kind of the heart of the village. As you mentioned also, like everything closes at night. Uh, tell, tell us the, the quick conversation you had with the village elder about, you know, places Ooh. to eat. And... It was, it's interesting. Uh, this gentleman, he's, he's, again, very interesting. We sat down uh, with him for tea and uh, he grew up in this village, but his primary language as a result of growing up here is Taiwanese, not Mandarin. And he didn't learn Mandarin until he went to Taipei for a little while and then came back. So his Mandarin is a little hard for me to decipher as I'm still trying to grow in my Mandarin abilities. And so we sat down with him for tea. Well, let's go okay. We s <laughs> Mailman and barking dog combination, right? <laughs> There you go, that's rural Taiwan, right? Yes. But um, anyway, so we sat down with our village uh, chief and uh, we're just trying to get to know him a little bit, get to know the history of the place. And at that time, because of COVID, uh, there weren't many things open. And so I wasn't sure if certain uh, restaurants would ever reopen or if they just weren't open because of COVID. So I asked him, I said, so are there places we can go and eat lunch and dinner here in the village? And he goes, oh, yeah, 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 we've got places. We've got two places for lunch and one place for dinner. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and so he kind of described where we could find these places. And, you know, we haven't gone to, uh, to them yet. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. The village is very run now in the morning. Lots of activity in the mornings. But then it gets really quiet because everyone's out in the factory or their fields, so they bring their lunch with them. And then after work, they pick up their kids and they go home. So unless there's an activity or a reason to get out of the house, people tend to be a little bit more quiet and a little bit more uh, family-oriented here in the village. So, I mean, you guys are new here, but your outlook is fairly long-term. So tell us about how having a long-term kind of outlook affects um, yeah, how you think about ministry and your ministry decisions and all that kind of thing. 
You want to take that one or you want me to? I'll do a little bit. I'm also going to see if they're coming all the way down or... Oh! <laughs> So, chances are we're not going to retire in Taiwan. It's something we haven't ruled off out, but we're going to turn that way. Uh, but chances are we're not going to. Whatever ministry we start or involved in needs to not be reliant upon us long term. It has to be something we can pass over to the local church. Um, we. We don't want to go on home assignment or on vacation or retire. And then all of a sudden, something we've invested in just withers and dies or stops. And not to say that that happens a lot with ministries, but it does happen with ministries. You know, I don't know if there's a percentage out there about it, but we want to avoid that by making sure that whatever we do is integrated with the local church. It is integrated with local believers so that it is dependent upon believers running the ministry instead of the missionaries running the ministry. Now, because we're missionaries, we can start some stuff that other people wouldn't do. Um, you know, if I can find somebody that with a little more language to help out, there's a jail down the road that we have a connection with somebody who knows somebody that works at the jail. They're looking for people that can help the people in the jail rehabilitate a little bit. Cheryl wants to start a project with some young ladies. You know, that isn't a normal thing that would be done here, but would be an awesome opportunity. Yeah, I, uh, I'm a quilter. Uh, a friend of mine taught me how to quilt back in America. And so I use quilting as a way of sharing Bible stories. And then each quilt has a picture, essentially, that has been quilted. It represents a Bible story. And then at the end, you have your 12 pictures and 12 Bible stories that you could share with people. And so things like that, if we can do them and partner with a local person and kind of show them what we do and learn from them and what they do, because we want to make sure that we're being relevant to people. We're not just bringing these crazy outside ideas. And so by working together, we kind of hope that it creates a long-lasting um, or potentially long-lasting ministry that can continue whether or not we're here. And if people are lacking in skills, we can teach them the skills. Or if we need to modify it so it makes more sense in a Taiwan context, then we modify how we would do ministry, perhaps from our own home culture, host culture, so that it makes more sense in the Taiwan context. I, I think also... And I know you were about to say something, but this just popped into my head. Um, having a long-term mindset means that we're invested in the relationships that we're starting. We're invested in the time that we're spending. It's not just like, oh, life is hard. I can move on to something else. Yeah. And we you know? also realize then that it takes time, especially as outsiders. And coming into rural Taiwan, like... We don't have the expectation that on the second or third meeting, someone's going to pray a prayer and decide to be baptized. Like we realize that we need to build that relationship. We need to build that trust. And that may take weeks, months, or even years. And we're willing to invest in people. And cross and go.